Hey, welcome to APC Brampton TV. Our desire is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the nations. We hope that you find this message powerful and impacting. If you would like to contact us, you can email us at info at allpeopleschurch.ca. If you would like to support us, you can go to our website at allpeopleschurch.ca and click on the red Give Online button in the top right-hand corner. Well, get ready for a life-changing word. But truly, it's an honor. It's a very special feeling for me to be here today because I see so many faces I remember from days gone by. I'm so happy to see you. I'm so honored to see you. And I'm so privileged to be here today. And I just pray, share God's heart with you. I just want you to know God incredibly loves you. And you have some incredible leaders here in your midst. We have a tremendous love and honor uh, for your pastor, Tony, here, and sister Carolyn here, and the family here, and your leaders here. You're part of something great that God is doing. Uh, I remember being here. Come on, that's right. Let's give him a hand. There's so much vision in the heart of your leadership here and in the heart of your leaders and so much transparency. Have you noticed how Pastor Tony is so transparent? Come on, do you know how King David, do you know that's one of the things that God liked about King David, that King David was very transparent with God. Uh, he didn't hide anything, and that's the way your pastor is. He has a heart for you, he has a heart of love for you, he cares about you, your community. I remember years ago, before you uh, uh, t took on uh, this call, when God called you to become the, the lead pastor here at APC, and, and you were living in another, another city at the time and working in the corporate world, a very large company, a $9 billion company in our nation. And he was a vice president there. And uh, God was using him, but God was shifting him into full-time ministry. And uh, I remember how he was wrestling about moving here. But, you know, he responded to that call, and he came here. And I believe that geography is connected to destiny. And I believe that there's something God's doing right here from this place in APC that's going to affect the geography uh, of the city of Brampton and the region and beyond. There's something about uh, moving from within your geography to the scope of where God is calling you across our nation. Amen? Amen. Now, as, as we get started here uh, this morning, obviously we have, uh, you know, limited time. And, uh, you know, I know I'm not in Africa where we normally do eight-hour services. <clears throat> and um, I remember in the early days where I'd be invited into places to... I go to home groups to speak, and I have 150 people in the house. Isn't that crazy? I wasn't in ministry back then. I was just, you know, a, a businessman trying to lead people to the Lord, and over time, that's what started to happen, and then you know the story from there on. But uh, I'm just going to pray here this morning and uh, just get right into the Word of God with you, and uh, we'll just uh, unpack uh, what God's put in my heart to share with you this morning. Would that be all right? Yes. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus this morning. I pray that my sentences proceed forth from your presence. I pray that you give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation to communicate the heart of the Father, the mind of Christ. And I pray, Father, that uh, your word will burn like fire within our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. And we all say, Amen, Amen. Would you go to the book of Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2 as we look up at our opening text this morning? This uh, message that I'm going to share with you began to birth in me sometime around 2011. The Lord spoke to me and he said, I want you to go tell my people to get in my house for what I'm about to do in the latter days. And prepare them for that. How many think that's important then? So this morning, if you were to title this message, you can title it The House of God. So Isaiah chapter 2 Verse 2, it says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains. And it shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. I want you to draw your attention in verse 3 to the term, the house of God. The house of God. That's where we're going to drive this from. But I'm also wanting you to, to notice that God is saying that the mountain of the Lord's house in the latter days is going to be above all mountains of culture and society. What is a mountain? It is a place of governing influence in our culture. It, it molds the minds of people groups. Uh, to give you an example, how many believe that 
you know, arts and entertainment, uh, the mountain of movies and arts and entertainment is a mountain that influences our culture and our children. Come on, how many believe that? How many believe the mountain of education? Education would be a mountain that our education system influences and molds our minds and the way we view things and perceive things and shapes our worldview. Would you agree? So there's various things like that in culture. But what God is saying above all these great mountains of influence, business and finance, there is a mountain that is above all these other mountains, and it's the mountain of the Lord's house. Amen? Now, um, with that in mind, let's go to uh, Genesis chapter uh, 28 real quick and dig into this term where it was first mentioned uh, in the Bible. This is the first time we're going to witness the mention of the word, the house of God, and we're going to look into it and see what it means. So let's look at Genesis 28, verse 10. I'm going to read you 10 to 22 right now. Let's read the story. Jacob here, the backdrop is running for his life. Uh, Esau is threatening to kill him. He's on his way to see his uncle Laban. He's in the middle of the night, in the middle of his journey. He's on a journey. He's heading somewhere. He's dealing with fear in his life, tremendous fear, and he's running for his life. But in the process, he stumbles into a specific certain place. And it says here, Jacob went out from Beersheba and went towards Haran. So he came to a certain place, say certain place, and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, and the land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth, you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south, and in you and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Come on. Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put out, excuse me, put at his head, set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of the place Bethel, but the name of the city had been loose previously. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going, and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house. And all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. This is the first mention of the house of God. And I want you to notice something. Here's Jacob on a journey. I believe we're all on a journey in our life Regardless of where we are, God is the author of our story. He's written a book about us before the foundation of the world. And I believe that you're on a journey. And it doesn't matter what your journey is, where you're coming from. What matters is where you're going. And on that journey, at some point in your life, we have the opportunity to intersect with God's house. For Jacob, it was a stone. How comfortable do you think a stone is to lay your head on to go to sleep? Come on. With all the advertisements of these amazing pillows that we have available to us, Jacob puts his head to rest on a stone and he even falls asleep. Isn't that amazing? He falls asleep with his head on a stone. And in the middle of his sleep, he's having sweet sleep. He begins to dream. I'm going to tell you something, folks. When you come into the house of God, you begin to dream again. Come on. Your dreams come alive when you come into the house of God. He began to dream. And he began to, in this dream, a ladder opened up, a stairway opened up to heaven. When you come into the house of God, I'm telling you, heavens open up over your life. Come on. The heavens open up over you. You get direct access to God. And he began to see this stairway. And at the top of the stairway, he encountered God himself. And he began to have a revelation of God. You come into the house of God, you're going to have a revelation of who God is. Come on. Regardless of your journey, regardless of your fear, regardless of what you're dealing with in your life, you're going to walk into an awareness and consciousness of who God is. Come on. 
And as he began to have that, and God began to speak to him about his destiny, because when you come into the house of God, God will begin to speak to you about your destiny and about your future. And God began to share his vision with him about how in his seed he's going to bless all families of the earth. And he began to share his covenant with Jacob and affirmed his covenant. I'm telling you, when you come in the house of God, God's going to begin to speak to you about his vision. And he's going to begin to inspire you. He's going to begin to reveal and unlock and unpack his covenant to you. And that covenant relationship is going to blossom. He began to see angels ascending and descending over the house of God. Something began to happen. He came into a supernatural place. The house of God is a supernatural place. Come on. And when he came into the house of God, he suddenly awoke from his sleep. When you come into God's house... You're going to wake from sleep, folks. You're going to wake up from your sleeping stupor. Your eyes are going to open up again. And he said, surely God is in this place. You're going to begin to develop an awareness and consciousness of God in your life. You're going to begin to know God is in your life. That's what happened to Jacob when he came into the house. See, he was on a journey. He was running for his life. He was dealing with turmoil. Somebody was threatening to kill him. How many know that's a serious position to be in? He had to leave his family. He had to go to his uncle who was a conniving, manipulative person. And in this journey and on this road, he encountered God's presence because he stepped into God's house. Come on. And then it says over here that he had a fear of God come on him, a respect and a reverence for God. You'll begin to have a deep reverence for God when you come into his house. How many believe these are good things for us? Come on. These are good things for us when we come in the house of God. And he said this. He goes on and he says that this is surely the house of God. That word stone in the Hebrew means pillar, ground of truth. It means plumb line. It means plumb line, by the way. And it's called the house of God. Bethel means the house of God. God introduced Jacob to his house. And in his house, Jacob began to encounter the God of the house of God. Come on. And then what happens is, um, he said, this is the gate of heaven. How many know that the Bible talks about that there's the gates of hell, come on. What does that mean? That's entry point of hell into earth. So what is the gate of heaven? The house of God is the gate of heaven, so heaven can enter into earth. How? Through the house of God. How many think that might be important to the latter days that we're living in? So there's so much that we can go into about this, uh, but I want you to notice that his life was touched because he entered into the house of God. And that's what's happened to you this morning. Many of you online are watching and you're entering into the house of God today and that's what you're doing. You're going to experience something. His presence is going to come. The fear of God is going to replace the fear of man, the fear of the enemy, the fear of circumstances and situations. You're going to come into a peace and you're going to realize that God has a plan for you, has a future for you, that you can dream again. He's going to begin to unlock vision in your life. He's going to unlock hope into your life. He's going to let you know you've come into a safe place. The house of God is a safe place. It's a place you can run and find safety. Come on. With that in mind, let's go to Matthew chapter 16. Let's dig into this some more. Matthew chapter 16. I'm going to read verse 17. Here's the context. Jesus is walking with his disciples. And uh, they're having a conversation. And Jesus said, hey, who do people say that I am? And they say, oh, some say you're the prophet Elijah. You're the prophet Jeremiah. You're a prophet. Some say you're a rabbi. You're a teacher. He says, okay, listen. Who do you say that I am? And suddenly, Simon by Barjona responds. And he says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And in response to this, in verse 17, Jesus says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Lots of stuff we can say about these verses here right now. First of all, I want you to know that Jesus immediately responded to Simon because he knew that his revelation of who Jesus is was not of human origin. Come on. It was, it was not of human origin. And so as a result, we need to understand that it was the Father that revealed Jesus to Peter. Because Jesus knew that no one can reveal the Father uh, except the Son, and no one reveals the Son except the Father. And to whomsoever the Son reveals the Father, 
uh, that's who gets to know the Father. Are you with me? So it's the Father. Come on, no one comes um, to the Son except the Father draws him first, right? And so Jesus knew that my Father had revealed to you my identity and who I am. And immediately Jesus responded and he said, you know, upon this rock I will build my church. The house of God, in other words. I'm going to build my church, the house of God. It's a synonymous word. It's the same thing. I'm going to build a church. I'm going to build the house of God. And guess what's going to happen? The gates of hell will not prevail against it. You know why? Because the house of God is the gate of heaven. When you set up a house of God and you establish a house of God, it begins to develop a governmental grace that comes over a city, over a region, and begins to release heaven. And it begins to bind up the gates of hell and release heaven through the gates of heaven. Come on, are you with me? Now, something else that you need to recognize. The very next verse, verse 19, it says, and, say and, and, and the keys of the kingdom will be given to you. Now, you notice it's connected to the church and the house of God. A lot of people think they have the keys of the kingdom, but I have news for you. The keys of the kingdom are in the house of God. You can't get, you, 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 the kingdom is within you and the kingdom is around you all over the world. But if you want to know how to function and operate in the kingdom and use the keys of the kingdom, you need to get into God's house. Come on. How many of you park your, come on. How many of you, I know, how many of you park your car outside your house? You park your car outside your house, don't you? Where do you, where do you put your keys? Inside. Come on. The keys of the kingdom are in the house of God. And those keys come to you because the gateway of heaven is over the house. Come on. That's where the open heaven is. It's the gate of heaven. That's where you get the keys from God's house. And you take the kingdom and you expand it all over the world. Through what you're called to do. Anybody with me? So the keys of the kingdom. Let's make it. Remember, we want to bring clarity. I'm all about clarity. I want you to have clarity how God wants you to know there's no division between the kingdom and the house. There's no division between the church age and the kingdom age. That's nonsense according to the Bible. Hello now. So we're just going to tell you the truth like it is. Come on. You are the house of God, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 3, 6. Hebrews 10, 21 says the whole body of Christ is the house of God. Come on. But it also says that the church is the house of God. Come on. And so God's calling you into his house. Now, what does it mean to bind something on earth and it will be bound in heaven? What God is saying is we're physically on earth, right? He's saying I'm going to uniquely release an authority to you that while you're on earth, from earth, you're going to bind something in heaven and it's going to be bound in earth. In other words, you have the authority from the earth realm to speak into the heavenly realm and govern the heavenly realm over the earth realm and change the earth realm as a result. So what you permit will happen, what you deny will be denied. So if you say no terrorist attacks in your city, they'll be stopped because you are the house of God and you have governmental authority. You are the gate of heaven and you can cause hell to cease in your city. Hello. When you speak peace over your city, peace will come. You can stop murders over your city, violence over your city. You can serve your city. You can release everything heaven is into your city and bind up everything hell is in your city because you're a part of God's house. And you're under the covering and the grace of the house of God. Where are the angels ascending and descending? They're descending over the house of God. That's where all the armies of heaven are. I'm telling you, the house of God is not just a place for you to come and experience family, although that's the primary purpose. But I'm telling you, the house of God is a place where you assemble and rank and order. You come into alignment with heaven's authority, and heaven's authority begins to operate through your life. And I'm telling you, there's always been people that have wanted to stay away from God's house. And that's why Satan works so hard to cause conflict in the house of God and cause people to stay away from the house of God. And we've all been through difficult circumstances in God's house because I'm going to tell you something. When you come into God's house, you run into people. And I'm telling you, if you want to grow and mature in love, you can't grow and mature in love until you fellowship and associate with some people. You can't grow in love till somebody offends you. You can't grow in love to somebody that's your brother and your sister who betrays you. That's when you learn to love somebody, forgive somebody. You can't just hide around and say, I'm not going to be in God's house. Come on. you got to get in the house of God, get under an open heaven, and you're going to begin to see some things happen. Because once you get under God's house, those armies begin to go to work for you. I remember um, we have a lot of prophets and ministers fly in to visit me and Pastor Sabina in and, and, and Langley. And they usually come for two, three days, stay with us, and we minister to them. I love prophets, by the way, just always love prophets, appreciate prophets. 
just have a tremendous love for them. We have other ministers come, but for some reason we primarily get prophets visiting us. And they'll spend two, three days with us. We'll pray with them. We'll talk about their ministry, their call, and help minister to them and bring some clarity to them about what God is really calling them to do. And we've seen great fruit from this type of ministry. So one of these prophets came, and uh, him and his wife, and we were taking them out for lunch uh, there. And uh, he was sharing with me how he's been to every major prayer meeting in the United States of America, very well-known, reputable places of prayer, uh, places that are doing some great things and are praying, and I'm thankful that they are praying. But they're saying, you know, we experienced a lot of warfare in our life. You know, uh, you know, our leg broke over here, our ankle broke over there. We had this car accident over here, and you know what? We're really pursuing God. We're praying hard, but we keep having these calamities. We keep having these situations, and they were chalking it up as spiritual warfare. And the more they were talking, the more scared I was getting. And I was like, oh boy. And it looked like to me they had like paint on their face like Braveheart. You know what I mean? And, and you know, they were like in war all the time. I mean, if you saw their muscles, I mean, they had some big muscles in the spirit. But their life was, how many know it's okay to be in war once in a while. But if you live your life on the battlefield, come on, that ain't too comfortable. Hello. You're going to develop some PTSD or whatever that's called. You, you, you're going to have some spiritual whatever it is. Come on, you're going to have some post-traumatic stress disorder, spiritually speaking, if you're in war all the time, if you're in the battlefield all the time. Anybody with me? And so they're talking to me about all this war, and i got to be honest with you, I don't go through warfare like that. But I'm looking at that, and I'm saying, God, this, you know, something's not right here. And uh, right in the middle of it, Jesus spoke to me. Matthew 16. And this verse over here, he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Come on. And I said to him, he says, ask him about that. So I asked him. I'm telling you, man, if you ever get a prophet to be quiet, it's a miracle. <laughs> so I turned to the prophet. I said, what about when Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it? You should have seen their jaw drop. And then I began to speak to them about alignment. And I said, you need to get in alignment with God's house. Just because you're called to ministry does not mean that you're separate from the house of God. You need to get in the house of God. And if you get in the house of God and you begin to benefit from what God's house has to offer, and you begin to put some principles of alignment in God's house, for example, if you begin to bring the whole tithe of your life out of your ministry, out of your business, out of your personal life, and you bring it into the house of God because that's where the tithe belongs, that's where Jacob said, I'm going to tithe in the house of God. You can put that disagreement to rest. Everybody's trying to figure out where the tithe goes. I'm going to tell you right now in the house of God, the Bible says it goes in the house of God. It's very clear. I said, you begin to take the tithe and you begin to honor God and you become, become part of God's house. You come under uh, spiritual authority in God's house. 90% of your warfare will cease. They took the counsel, applied it. I met them not too long ago, actually last year, and 90% of all the warfare has ceased in their life. Their ministry is prospering. Their finances are doing great. They're doing better than they've ever done. And they said, thank you so much for what you taught us because it has literally changed our life. Come on. See, there's always going to be people. There's always going to be people because, you know, we all have vision in our heart. We all have destiny within our heart. I know, and we all want to do something with that. But we need to become part of God's house, even though God's house is not perfect because it's made of people. We're not perfect, but the Bible says we are living stones. You are a living stone. You're part of the tapestry of God's house. If you're not here, we're missing a piece of God's house. You are the body of Christ. Come on. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 3 for a moment. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 15. Are you ready? Paul the apostle is about to visit Timothy. We're picking up the context of this in verse 15. He goes, if I am delayed, I write that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. So he's writing to the church that Timothy is over. So the house of God here is clearly being defined as the church. Now, if you're unsure, it continues to go on. Conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. And it is the pillar and ground of the truth. This is the same word, pillar, ground of truth, because it is the same definition of the stone or the house of God that Jacob first experienced. Paul the apostle, who knows the history, who is a Jewish person, who is a Hebrew of Hebrews, come on, who understands what it means to be a Pharisee. He knows what it means to be of the tribe of Benjamin. He knows this whole stuff. So he's using the same language as he's talking about God's house. He's referring to that stone, Bethel, the house of God. That's what he's calling it, Bethel. 
the pillar, the ground, the plumb line, the stone. And he's going on and he's saying it's the church. Guess what the word church here? The same word where Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That Greek word is ekklesia. That is the same word ekklesia here. It is the same word ekklesia there in Matthew 16. So the ekklesia is the house of God. Now, there's a bit more understanding on this word ecclesia because when the word ecclesia was used, it was a common Greek word in Greek culture. It was not a biblical word. The Bible didn't come up with it. It was a word used in the Greek language. The ecclesia, for example, in Greece would be the gathering of the elite leaders, the political people in office, the movers and shakers of society. Even the wealthy people would gather together. And what they would do is, as an ecclesia, they would gather and they would invite somebody called a preacher. The word preacher that's translated in English is a Greek word that was common in Greece because they already had preachers. The apostles were not the first preachers. Preachers already existed. And the preacher was somebody who was typically a medium. He would come and stand before the ecclesia, the called out ones, the selected ones from within society that represented society and that would have influence and governing influence to govern society. They were the top echelon people that could govern society. They were chosen, pulled out, selected and invited to this place of ecclesia where really governmental decisions were made on a national scale. And so what they would do is invite a preacher. The preacher would be a medium and his job was to channel the spirit realm and begin to get insight because you know how the Greeks were, you know. They're all about philosophy and insights and they would call this preacher and he would come and begin to channel the spirit realm and begin to get knowledge and try to communicate with them that would influence the ecclesia so they could influence their world. The only difference is we have an ecclesia that God has called out from the world and assembled together. That's why we're assembling not just as a family, we're assembling in proper rank and order. And as we do, we begin to hear from the Holy Spirit through people that He's put together. And we begin to move into the realm of the Spirit and get insight and revelation and wisdom and communicate it with God's people so they can apply it in their world. Come on. So the keys of the kingdom are released and you can use them everywhere you go where you can bind up hell with the keys of the kingdom and unlock heaven with the keys of the kingdom. And so, let's go to, um, now, the house of God is not just the church itself, the local church family. It's also you individually. Hebrews chapter 3 says it this way. It says that Christ, who is the son over his own house, whose house you are, Hebrews 3, 6, you are also the house of God. Now, here's what that means. Even if you're not part of a church, you're still individually part of God's house. No question about it. And you always will be. And you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But the power you're going to operate in is a dimension of personal power. Holy Spirit still greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. But like I said to you, you're going to be dealing with more warfare in your life. And you can win. You have every right to win over the enemy every single time. But I'm telling you something. When you get in the boxing ring and you stay there a little too long... You can get bloody and bruising. But you see, the right alignment, Hebrews 10, 21 says that Jesus is our high priest over the house of God. And I believe that's not just over the local church, but over the house of God in general. But the right alignment is that you who are the house of God, meaning you're a living stone, should confine your place part of God's local church, the house of God, so we can have a corporate expression of God in our city and in our lives. And then we collectively become part of the body of Christ, which we have even a greater expression together in the world. That's the right alignment. So it's almost like several floors in the same house. Right? It's one thing to live in the basement. It's another thing to live in the living room and live in the bed. So God wants you to bring alignment between you, God's house, bring you into his house so that Jesus, who's the high priest over the house of God, can express himself through his body. Now, how many believe that we're the body of Christ? How many of you have ever taken your hand and hit it on a wall while you're walking through a doorway, smashed it somewhere, cut your finger? Anybody ever done anything like that before? Okay. What if your hand got offended with you and said, that's it, I'm leaving you? And now your hand walks away, you're missing your right hand, and you're going around, and you're praising God, and you got one hand missing. Come on now. What if your foot gets offended and said, listen, we've been sitting too long in church. 
You've not been using me the way I'm supposed to be used. You're not even grateful that I carry this weight all day long and you get all the credit. You, can't, you couldn't get anywhere if it wasn't for me. And then somebody prophesies over your foot and says, O foot, O thou great foot. There has never been a foot like thyself in all the world. Thou art so anointed, O foot, and taken for granted by your own body. And you say, that's it, that's the word of God. You get excited about it, and the foot disappears. Now you've got one hand missing, you've got one foot missing, and what are you doing? You're like this. Oh, and then you want to go to the world. And you got one eye popped out because the prophetic eye said, I see what you don't see. You don't listen to what I see, so I'm out of here. So you got one eyeball missing. You got one ear missing. You got a hand missing. And you go to the world and you say, hey, world, you want to be like me? We're the body of Christ. Hello. No wonder the world's like, I don't want what you got. I don't want what you got. Come on, are you with me? I know I'm being strong, but I hope I'm helping you today. Because there's some plans that God has in the latter days for His house and you don't want to miss out on them because there's good news coming to the house of God in these latter days. And that's why God wants you in His house because He's about to do something very strategic in these next 8 to 10 years that you have never seen in your life. So what am I saying? You could be afoot and go to this conference. That's what people do. They leave the house of God and go from conference to conference to conference to conference. And they go to the foot conference. And all these feet are over there and they're dancing away. And man, they can dance like nobody can dance. And then they're, they realize in the same hotel they're having an eyes conference where all the eyes have gotten together in the body. And they're having a beautiful conference because they all relate to one another. And they're seeing things like you wouldn't believe. They're dancing in the next room with the feet. And they're seeing things in the next room. It's absolutely amazing. And then the eyes begin to see a foot walking down the hall. Begin to prophesy over them. You're the most amazing feet. So good that you've gathered together. In fact, I see God is using you. You can dance like no one can dance. Well, it's true. But they were supposed to be part of the body so the body could dance. And the eyes are like, you're the most beautiful feet I've ever seen. And then a nose walks down the hallway and says, you know, it really stinks in here. <laughs> because guess what? Apart, when you are separated from the body, you decay and you die and you start to smell. Hello, in the spirit. Is it okay if we just be a little graphic here with you? That's what happens. I've seen more tragedy in people's lives when they're not aligned to the house of God and they go out there and they want a war. Let me, let, me, let me kind of wrap this down a little bit so far. You know how I said to you that the mountain of the Lord's house will be exalted above all the mountains of culture and society? I know there's some teaching out there about these seven mountains. Have you heard of it? I'm sure you have. And it's come about, you know, in the last several years, and it came about because two men were given this insight at a time when the church had separated the sacred from the secular. They said, we just stay in the church and we don't deal with the world. And God was trying to help them say, listen, you need to go from the house of God, and you need to go in there and bring the kingdom into the world. How many agree? So they understood the seven mountains that exist in the world. But now we've got a misinterpretation of it from beautiful people with amazing hearts and what they're missing is one fine-tuning thing. Yeah, there are seven mountains of culture, but the house of God is the eighth mountain. And it is the mountain superior to all those other seven mountains. And if you've ever seen a mountain range, and trust me, we live around mountains all around us, there's always one mountain that has a peak over all the other mountains. There's no denying which is the main mountain. And so what God is saying, the mountain of the Lord's house is the eighth mountain. And from that mountain range, which is the highest, you see the peaks of other seven mountains of culture. And the church is not part of the seventh mountain. The seventh mountain, they say, is the mountain of religion. The church is not religion. Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, that's the mountain of religion. Come on, we're the mountain of the Lord's house that's above the mountain of religion. 
So if we're going to become the mountain of the Lord's house and we're going to be part of the mountain of religion, we're not on the same playing field as Islam and Hinduism and Buddhism. That's not who we are. We are the gate of heaven. We are the mountain of the Lord's house. And that's why he says in the last days, the latter days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be exalted above all the other mountains. And guess what latter days means? The latter days did not start in the Old Testament. The latter days started post-cross. The last days didn't even begin till the day of Pentecost. When Peter got up and said, remember Joel said, In the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Come on, young men shall have dreams and old men sh I mean, young men shall see visions and old men shall dream dreams. And he called that, this is that that was spoken, meaning this is the last days. The last days started on the day of Pentecost. So this scripture is not about the Old Testament. It's about the house of God, the church, the mountain of the Lord's house, Mount Zion. Boy, we've come up to heavenly Jerusalem, Mount Zion, to an innumerable company of angels, Hebrews chapter 12. No wonder you have angels with you in the house of God. So this is what God spoke to me. He said to me, son, if you're going up to take a mountain of society, you're on the wrong mountain. He says, but if you're coming down the mountain to take another mountain, you're on the right mountain. Come on, many people have tried to climb other mountains. And if you climb those other mountains, you're going to see when you start to get close to the top, a bunch of gravestones of people that will say, I made it this far, and I died in faith. I got taken out at 100 yards by so-and-so, Mr. Demon. Why? Because the tops of these mountains of society are dominated by principalities. And I tell you something, it's hard to fight somebody that's at the top of the mountain. They got an advantage. They can throw a rock down at you and you're taken care of. They can, they can see you coming. They can take you out. How many of us a very difficult task? And many people in the church are trying to go to those mountains. Many of them try to go to the arts entertainment mountain in Hollywood. What about Elvis Presley? Do you know he came out of the church? What about Whitney Houston? What about Michael Jackson? Do you know all these people came out of the church? But they were somehow told to go from that mountain. They didn't need the house of God. They went without the house of God up that mountain, and they all got taken out prematurely. Hello. And now we're training people to do the same thing. I'm telling you, you got to get in the house of God, the mountain of the Lord's house, then go to these other mountains. That's why when we moved to uh, Langley, British Columbia, uh, God had us establish the mountain of the Lord's house. And we laid down our media ministry, and people thought we were smoking. And they're like, why would you give up your media ministry to minister to hundreds of thousands of people, even millions, to go build the church or plant the house? They didn't know what we were doing. We were building the mountain of the Lord's house. So as we build the mountain of the Lord's house, God would cause us to go into the mountain of media. And out of that time, God reorganized our vision and helped us understand the structure and infrastructure. And that's where Malik Media was born. Did you know we work in the film industry today? And we work with Hollywood because they're making movies in our studios at Malik Media. Why? So God began to give us influence and authority in the mountain of media because we began to build the mountain of the Lord's house. Hello, anybody here with me? The other way works too, but it's difficult. Now remember, Holy Spirit will work with you regardless of where you are. Holy Spirit will work through any avenue you make available to Him. He won't argue with you. But His preference is to work from the mountain of the Lord's house and then go into society. And this began to happen in our life. That's where the Plumb Line Network was birthed. Uh, and it's our ministry to the world. And that's where the television program is going to come back. And all kinds of media ministries being birthed and being prepared right now as we speak. Because it's a media mountain. Then also print media. My book, 10 Amazing Muslims Touched by God, is gone by the grace of God and the help of other amazing ministries. It has now reached 500,000 Muslim homes in North America. All while we are building the mountain of the Lord's house. Anybody with me here? So what God's saying is you build my house. From the mountain of my house, you're going to have angels accompany you. They will go with you because that's the gate of heaven. That's how you go to Hollywood. That's how you go in the business world. That's how you go in the finance world. That's how you go into the education world. That's how you make a difference in your world. You go from the mountain of the Lord's house with governing grace and authority, with angelic deployment with you, accompanying you into the task at hand. So if you're an evangelist, a prophet, a minister, a teacher, whoever you are, if you're traveling, you need to be in the house of God. And then you're going to see your ministry flourish. You're going to see your business flourish. You're going to begin to see God do some great things for you because I'm telling you, heaven will open 
open up over you. Because you're connected to God's house. Because you honor Him in His house. And you're not divided in your loyalties to the house of God. The house of God comes first for me and my wife. It comes first. I met my wife in the house of God right here in Mississauga. God began to give me revelation and speak to me about my future and my ministry way back in 2002 in November. Uh, he spoke to me while I was in the house of God. Vision unlocked in my life. Trances opened up in my life. I began to see the future. Things that we're doing today I saw in 2002 in trances and open visions because God began to speak to me because I was connected to God's house. Because in God's house, heaven opens up. My eyes opened up and God began to speak to me about vision and my future. Hello. Because I've been part of the house of God. Hello. And that's what we're doing, building the mountain of the Lord's house right where we are. And I believe as you come into God's house, there's two dimensions of authority. You step into something called governmental authority. And I know we've all been hurt and offended in our journey because God's house and church is not perfect. It's not perfect. We've all been there. But I want to tell you something. Jesus is greater. And his love and his incredible grace is more awesome than your pain. And you might be a grape that's been squeezed because of your journey. You might be an olive that has been squeezed. But I want to tell you something. God's going to use the wine of your life from the crushing and crushing of the grapes of your life. And he's going to make it so intoxicating to the world with the love of Christ. Because something will happen in you when you mix Jesus with your pain. I'm telling you something. He'll make your pain and turn it into wine. It will become so fragrant and so unique that it will become the state of your being. And others will drink of the wine of your life and they will say, what is it about you? Why is it that you have a fragrance and a sweetness and a calming experience where heaven comes into my life just by being around you? Is it because you pray? No, it's because you've overcome with Jesus in your life and he made you more than a conqueror because you know what? We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. It's the love of God that makes you a conqueror. It's your state of being. It's who you are. Come on, gates will get you through the problem. Faith will give you the victory, but love will make you more than a conqueror in life. And when you experience the love of God in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your journey, I'm I'm telling you a fragrance comes out of your life I'm telling you he takes your olives and makes them oil and the anointing and the oil of the spirit begins to flow from the inside of you and your state of being increases in the stature of the anointing of Christ in your life and you begin to have something even when you talk about beans and potatoes and people say what is it about you because God has taken that which was painful in your journey, that which was difficult and made it sweet. And he's made it a testimony, made it a message. That's because you came into God's house and he begins to work his workmanship on you. And I'm telling you, he begins to move you forward for the good works that he foreordained you for. And that which he wrote about you in a book before the foundation of the world. He begins to move you in that direction. And so, I hope you're being encouraged this morning. And as I get ready to hand it back over to Pastor Tony here this morning. I want to remind you that God loves you incredibly, loves you incredibly. And if you could just bow your head for just a moment here this morning, feel to just do this today. If you're here this morning and you're hearing this message today and you have not been part of God's house, whether you're here and you're not part of a church family somewhere or you're visiting from somewhere, if you're not been part of God's house, or you don't feel like you've really been committed to and part of God's house. You know what I'm saying? You can go through the motions and just attend, you know, but you've just been afraid, sitting on the edge, you know, wondering, I don't want to get too close here. I might get hurt again. If you just, everyone just bow your heads and close your eyes. I just want to give a moment of privacy to people here. If you're here and you're saying, you know what, today, God, I want to make a commitment today to forgive those that have hurt me in your house, in my journey, and I want to make a commitment to join and become part of the house of God. Whether it's here or if you're visiting it's your church where you go to, whatever it is, you understand what I'm saying? Would you kindly raise your hand? Come on, raise it up high. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Come on. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Come on. Come on, you can put your hands down. I just want to pray over you and I want to pray over this house and turn it over to the pastor here. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for these people that have been hurt in their journey and have been wounded. And Father, I pray the healing balm of Gilead will come upon their hearts. And I pray that you would heal them from the turmoil and their pain. That you would mix your incredible love with their journey and that you would cause a sweetness to come out of them, a fragrance that reveals and represents you. 
And Father, I pray right now that the house of God, the blessing and the open heaven that's over your house will come upon their lives and come over this city and come over this region. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And we all say, Amen, Amen. Here's Pastor Tim.